Welcome to Leadership Roundtable with John Samuel. Leadership lessons from the Holy Week. Okay, now this week we will study the leadership lessons from the Holy Week. It was exactly on 15th April 2019. The cathedral in Paris. You will recall there was a major fire. It was a Monday. It was a Holy Week. Monday in the Holy Week in 2019. As far as the cathedral in Paris, everyone respects the, this particular cathedral. For them, this is one of the important places. I've been to this uh, cathedral when I went to Paris. It's an enormous place and plenty of people every time they come. Uh, for them, it is an important place. The reason I want to tell you, you now today is somewhere around, maybe last week we had our Easter, that Holy Week was going on. This happened in 2019 Holy Week. That year, they could not hold the Easter in the cathedral. People felt extremely bad. Or even this year they could not do because the cathedral is being rebuilt. It might take more time. Think about 2020. A large number of cathedrals and churches were closed on Easter Sunday, even during the Holy Week. Think about 2021. The same thing happened. The churches are closed during the Holy Week. Easter Sunday, we are not able to celebrate. We are living in tough times. Please understand. That's what they want to bring in. We are living in tough times. And not only because of COVID-19, even one year prior to that, 2019, the entire cathedral was into flames. The COVID-19 situation continues even this year we do not know what is in hope for us what is in future for us this is a time that we need to come back to god today the churches are empty the tomb continues to be empty doesn't matter if, even if the church is empty but this should bring us a revival the empty tomb brought courage to the people to the disciples from cowards they became courageous people I think the empty churches today and the last year should revive us. I do not know whether you have heard of this lady, Julian of Norwich, who has written this famous book, Revelations of Divine Love. Julian of Norwich is a, a 14th century lady who was the first woman to write a book. Please understand. Who was the first woman to write a book in English. And it was the time, you know, you will recall in the 14th century, there was a kind of a black uh, death. They call it a black death. Almost one third of the European population was wiped out. One third of the European population was wiped out. Please understand. Those days, there were no inoculation, there were no, um, you know, maybe they were following the social distancing, but uh, I don't think they had masks and things like that. So they say almost one third of the people died. And it was at that time that she was born. And she grew up, again, a major famine struck them. And she herself was affected in terms of sickness. And she was almost, you know, about to die. That was the time she heard God's call. She saw, she saw Jesus Christ in her vision. And then she has written all those visions nicely in this book. And that's how she is remembered for writing the revelations. And after that, I think the history says almost 30 years she lived. Everybody thought that she would die immediately. 30 years, God gave her very good health. And she had put all those visions in that beautiful book. And even today, they have a church, St. Julian Church in Norwich, in, in UK. I mean, I would like you to pick it up in case you can get that book. It's a wonderful area. 
But in that book, with all those challenges, the reason why I want to tell you is all those challenges of death, sickness, disappointments. This is the word she says, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. This is a famous quote of Julian of Narvik in her book, Revelations of Divine Love. Today, when uh, COVID-19 is affecting almost a large number of people, we need people like Julian of Narvik who will get on to Jesus Christ, get revelations from God, not just praying alone. We need to get revelations from God. We should come out to the community. All shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. You know, yesterday we had, um, after the um, National Missions Consultation Program, we had uh, another meeting on um, Indian Christian Day, where um, the Bishop of Amritsar, former moderator of Church of North India, he was also there, he was speaking. And when I invited him to speak in that program, I was telling him, see, look here, COVID-19, everyone talks about COVID-19. There's no hope. We, we don't know. Nobody is able to say what's going to happen. But as Christian community, our response, can we at least start a time of prayer? I, I still recall in the initial days when the COVID-19 came, all of us were spending time on prayer. But over a period, we have completely lost. Now, what's our response? This lady came up with a very good response. When she heard God's revelation, she says, all shall be well. So today, when we think about this um, Holy Week, after that, we find that Jesus Christ died on the cross. We also say that by his stripes, we are healed. And then the death could not hold him. And uh, there is an empty tomb where Jesus Christ shows himself to all his disciples and says, Peace be with you. I think this is what it is. All shall be well. All shall be well. All men of things shall be well when God is with us. Love, God's love was all around and Julian saw it like no one else. It was almost like God lifted the blinders off her eyes and God showed her how things really were. That it was love that was holding everything together. I think that is what God wants us at this time when the nation is going through COVID-19. Christians, will we show our love? Lockdown with the Lady Julian. Very interesting. If you look at it, it was a lockdown because she was, after that, she completely locked herself inside a church when she was writing this book. And at a very, very long he says, what strikes me today about Julian is that in the midst of a world filled with such grief, loss, death and uncertainty, she could write with so much confidence about the mercy, grace and love of God. I think that's what the, the Holy Week should teach us. Now let's get to the specific leadership lesson that we will go through today. Can anybody tell me when is the Passover? This year, Passover is how many days? Passover celebration, I know Christians probably, we have not been doing it. The Jews have been doing it. I think we should also celebrate somewhere. We have lost in touch with that. But do you, do you know how many days they celebrate the Passover? Passover is celebrated for eight days. Totally, they do it eight days. And in fact, it, it almost come during the uh, Holy Week's time. Holy Week is also eight days, not seven days. We call it one week. It is seven days, but it's actually eight days. And the Passover is also celebrated eight days. What is the Passover? What does it mean? The death passed over. The death passed over wherever there was a blood. After this particular incident, the people were walking free. The slaves were walking free. I think the interesting thing is that the slaves walked free. That's called the Passover. So Passover is nothing but a freedom festival. The first freedom movement that happened in the history, it was in Egypt. And it was God-initiated freedom movement. Please understand. It was not led by a man. Yes, Moses, God did put Moses into the center stage. But it was God-initiated because 
the bible says in the book of exodus if you see god saw god heard and then god acted and it was those the 10 incident that has happened and the, it finally culminated in the death of the first born then they were walking free the thing that i want to tell you is that hey holy week when you talk about always holy week falls around the passover and the bible makes it very clear jesus christ went to jerusalem at the time of the passover very clear you know jesus christ planned everything minutely why should he choose only the passover time in the in the christianity everything begins over there from that particular day the passover everyone remembers and passover is nothing but giving freedom making people free from their slavery getting people free from their bondage getting people free from their sins getting people free from their curses is freedom christianity should always be concerned about freedom when there is less freedom or when there is no freedom in some parts of india or some specific sections of the people do not have freedom it's a christians who should be able to not only just raise the voice you know many times we say that i will raise the voice no i don't want you to be only an activist quite often you know i will raise the voice so what it doesn't matter if even if you no will you be concerned and finally see that it stops who was that member of the parliament in uk who was willing to abolish slavery what's his name he did not just raise his voice he wanted to ensure that it is done and for that sake he became a member of the parliament he didn't want to be a minister he wanted to be only a member of the parliament and involve everybody so that the slavery is abolished so the first thing that i would say when we talk about this holy week think about freedom passover is nothing but freedom it's a freedom festival in fact i'm just giving the basic you know they they also the jews also celebrate the, when they celebrate passover they also have uh, the bread and wine or grape juice uh, i think i have had an occasion to celebrate this passover while i was in srinagar so it's almost similar but it's a little more than that more than the normal communion that we have you remember in the book of exodus moses goes and tells let my people go god will set his people free and so set your hearts on freedom so when when gandhi ji was concerned about freedom i know many christians were also concerned about freedom for india but today in some parts of india when people do not have adequate freedom because they belong to a particular caste or because they belong to a particular tribe or because they are poor and the freedom is denied what's the role of you and me freedom from oppression freedom from slavery freedom from bondage should be the concern of every christian i think that's the first thing that we learn from the holy week so holy week happens or it 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 comes together along with the passover and passover represents freedom and as christians we should be concerned about freedom that's the first thing that i would say second one i think this is what we learned we discussed it we have been given the charge of the mission now it's your turn take charge i think that's what he did when he called all the disciples when they had the final supper the last supper he says hey guys now my time is over my time has come to an end i will very soon be taken as a prisoner and then i will be crucified on the cross but let me tell you i will rise on the third day this he makes it very clear even at the time of transfiguration and then later on when the disciples are met together again he makes it the very same thing take charge of the mission it's your job and my job but when you take the mission don't say that my mission is to go and preach the gospel alone i think that's where things are different here 
Yes, I want you to go and preach the gospel, make disciples. On what manner? Take the role of a servant. Love one another. If you do these things, then you are in charge of the mission, not in terms of just evangelism going and proclaiming. Take the role of a servant. Love one another. It's a new job we have to take on. Some of us are hesitant to take on. Some of us have quit. I think as in the case of Judas, he quit. And as in the case of Peter, he denied. Thankfully, God restored him back. Some of us have been denying. Some of you have been indifferent. Some of us probably have quit some time. But God says, take charge. The third thing is, and I like the statement of Laura Bush. So leadership is not about popularity. It's about doing what's right. Jesus Christ was not about popularity. Hey, you know, if he was popular, if he wanted to be popular, he would have done different things. Here it is not about popularity. Kind of impact leadership is all about making impact and they are not driven by a quest for popularity. Think of impactfulness. Think of effectiveness rather than popularity. Some of the things we do may not be popular because what we do is right. You can be definitely popular by doing what is right. But don't think about the popularity and do things wrong. Jesus Christ was not doing a popularity contest for him. He was always doing the right thing. Lead us show courage over cowardice. You know, I mean, very interesting thing. You know, Jesus Christ was showing the courage at this particular point of time. He was not covered at that time. When you know, people were coming to arrest him, you know, we are looking for Jesus Christ. He said, yes, hey, here I am. Show courage. Don't be a coward when such situations come. Jesus Christ knew what he was going through. You and I also should know that we are going through what is intended in our life. God's perspective. That's what we learned from the life of Joseph. Show courage. Don't be a coward. Joseph was courageous when he faced Potiphar's wife. He was courageous. He was not a coward. But courage is needed to stand up. Not necessarily. One is stand up and speak up. That's one area. Courage will also allow us to sit down and listen. Be courageous. Leaders stand alone but are never alone. I think this is a thing that I want to tell you again. Leaders stand alone. There are occasions because what you are doing is right, you will stand alone. And I have already introduced a book written by one of the retired IAS officers. The Honest Always Stand Alone by Mr. Somaya, who retired as the Chief um, uh, Vigilance Commissioner and later on he became the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. The Honest Always Stand Alone. True. You will stand alone when you take certain decisions. Gandhiji was standing all alone. Just before the Independence Day, the nation was in turmoil and uh, there was a communal clash. Khan said, you know, we can't celebrate independence when there is a communal clash. I will go to Kolkata. And very few people followed him. He stood alone. Doesn't matter. So be willing to stand alone. A true leader has the confidence to stand alone. The courage to make tough decisions and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. But because you are standing alone, don't you know, play a solo game. They are never alone. In the sense, they always bring others. I think that's what Jesus Christ did. He took those three disciples closer to him or sometimes 12, sometimes 72. You will stand alone, but you are never alone. You know the life of Rosa Park, how she stood alone in the bus. Nobody was standing alone at that time, but she stood alone when, the, when they said that she should get up from the seas. She, she refused. She stood alone. Yes, she was taken to the police station. But she stood alone. Nelson Mandela, he stood alone. When his own party, the entire party said, no, we will choose violence. He said, no. We will go for reconciliation. We will go for forgiveness. He stood alone. But they are never alone. Jesus Christ stood alone. But he was never alone. He had a group of people. And he says, I have given an example in the kind of washing the feet. I want to tell you, leaders they either wash hands or they wash the feet. You can choose. You either wash your, wash your hands because 
you you are irresponsible or you wash the feet of others who was the one who washed the hands during this holy week who was the one who washed the hands pilot so you can choose the choice you can have the choice quite often many of us many christian leaders they wash their hands indifferent i can't do anything we wash our hands now he pilot also says i found nothing against this man but he had the power he want to be popular along the people so he just washed his hands nothing more he just washed his hands here is another leader who was washing the feet of the disciples i just want to share with you some of these differences between the two one leader served others one leader served himself one leader led the crowd one who followed it one leader made hard decisions one made expedient decisions now um, i was going through the current crisis that is happening in myanmar suddenly on march 1 the whole country is taken over by the military people who were chosen democratically they are put behind bars and today many people are dying now what's our response the indian government has taken expedient decisions that's what i would say maybe they are diplomatic but are we willing to take hard decisions telling them hey this cannot happen because you remember the first principle we said what was the first principle freedom freedom is affected in uh, myanmar and we do not want to open our mouth and say hey freedom has been affected or when china is um, sending its groups of uh, those ships around the spratly islands in uh, uh, south china sea near philippines what's our response freedom so probably he was taking expedient decisions yes they are not hard decisions but expedient ones quite often that's what happens with us one was making an eternal impact the other one was only popular thing one was confident another was insecure one had the courage another had the cowardice one stood alone and one leader was alone one was committed to long term vision the other one short term one took ownership the other one did did not want any responsibility one gave up his position the other one protected his position one even went to the extent of dying for his followers whereas one cared only for himself so you can choose whether you want to wash your hands or wash the feet of others that's the one i want you to teach people when you go and share this story with many others in your office in the family in your society i think this is what well, that's what monday thursday is all about that is what the holy week is all about and uh, we rise by lifting others i think that's what he did servanthood servant leadership taking up the towel and basin is simply an act of service and an expression of leadership taking up the towel probably we need to kneel we need to suffer but we are getting up from our table i think if you see that incident when jesus christ he got up from the table knelt down took the basin water towel and then as an act of service he washes the feet of his own disciples and then tells them hey i have done it he doesn't say okay come and do it for me no i want you to do a similar thing for others i think that is the important thing that we learn from here now another thing that happened is you know the temple was cleaned it happened on the uh, palm sunday when jesus christ goes there he was concerned about the temple every temple needs cleansing now and then maybe the temple made of brick and mortar and probably the temple when he says you are the temple of god both the things the churches need to be clean when i say cleaning it is not cleaning with water probably there are churches where which have become you know instead of place for prayer it has become commercial today i am not criticizing any any other any any church even I, the place where i have also been going there are challenges every temple every church needs cleansing and not only the church we need to be cleansed jesus christ is more concerned about the body of the church now i really wonder you know when when a yeah, woman who was um, caught in adultery she is brought before jesus christ what's his response women caught in adultery what was his response those who are not sin 
stone her. Yes, yes. And then what does he say further? No, he was not. He he was a person who did not have any sin. Did he stone her? He forgives her. Okay, the leaders they don't throw stone. We remember we studied in some time back. The leaders don't throw stones at others. What do they do? They throw flowers. They throw flowers. Leaders don't throw at one another because somebody has done something wrong. They throw flowers, but when it is concerned with the church. There is a passion of Jesus Christ rising above, and He says, "I want to clean it." The church should be a place which should be a model. So even when a lady is affected by when she is caught in the act of adultery, Jesus Christ says, "I will forgive you." But when it comes to the church, Jesus Christ is rather upset. So every church, every person needs cleansing. The important thing is love one another. And he says, "It's a mandate, a new command I give you. It's not a choice. It's a command to be obeyed, not an option to be considered. Loving one another, loving members of your family, loving people who are around you. Even in the case of Judas Iscariot, even though he knew that he is going to betray him, still he loved him." breaking bread around the table is about much more than bread you know he took the disciples and he was breaking the bread the communion you know quite often you know we take communion only in a very very serious manner thinking it is only holy it is more than that whether we are at the communion table or even at your dinner table or in a breakfast table breaking bread is about sharing life embracing diversity and learning to love at a deeper and more sacrificial level break the bread with many of your friends embrace diversity call them to your home break the bread i think that's a wonderful way to show that you care for others i think during the time of this um, passover the jewish community generally they bring people from every neighborhood neighboring places they will call them come and share the bread they'll bring them over there and say okay come and share the bread here is wine or here is a grape juice here is a bread we are all having food and call everybody embrace diversity learn to love one another so breaking bread should be a common thing not just in the church break the bread at your home bring others and pray this prayer of commitment beautiful prayer father not my will but yours be done somebody says this is a prayer of indifference lord it's not my will i want to be indifferent whichever way that happens doesn't matter but your will be done i think that's the way that we need to go forward let your will be done because i am yours i am yours yeah this is a tough area please understand being betrayed is one of the most valuable lessons life can catch let me tell you beware of those who kiss up to you and learn to live like betrayal to be a mature human being one must move from a childish naive trust to an adult recognition that betrayal is a part of life you will have betrayal from your neighbors from your family members from your colleagues that will be betrayal don't be childish move from childishness to the next level where you understand that there will be betrayal but it always calls us to forgiveness that will be betrayals please learn to live with that i know i have gone through such things you would have gone through such things but when there is a betrayal jesus christ did not say nothing about it still he included him as part of that 12 people in that final supper going along with the crowd is always a risky venture politically socially theologically crowds seldom make wise decisions don't join the crowd just because majority has taken a decision doesn't matter that it is the right one 
It's not about the majority versus minority. Today, that's what is happening. Majoritism, I have majority and so I can take decision. Going along with the crowd is a risky venture. You may not take the right decision. That's unfortunately the difficult part of the, uh, the democracy. Be willing to stand alone. 10 versus 2. 10 people, 12 people were sent to go into Canaan to find out whether they can take over or not. 10 said no and 2 said yes, we can do. The 10 were wrong. The 2 were right. And I think as we come to the final part of, you know, that's a passage that we were reading today. Two times, two weeks, Jesus Christ gets to the disciples and he says, peace be with you. There is fear, there is uncertainty, there is discouragement, there is disillusionment, there is a kind of you know threat that they will be arrested. Jesus Christ says, hey, I can tell you, there will be peace. There are challenges. Today, the country is going through a lot of challenges. Many, many Christians, many, uh, many missionaries have been going through many challenges. But let me tell you, Jesus Christ says, let there be peace be with you because I rule. And so he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Beautiful thing, you know, again, two things. A few days back that he was saying, hey, take charge. Now here, on the Easter day, again, he tells, hey, my Father has sent me. Send me with a lot of power. I am sending you with the same power. Go and share this peace with one another. It's an empty grave. Tells you that the grave is not our final destination. Very interesting thing. What does grave, empty grave talks about? The grave is not our final destination because if God, Jesus Christ is risen, I will also rise up one day. What a great hope. The grave is not our final destination, my dear brothers and sisters. I think this is what the Holy Week teaches very clearly. It's Friday. Sunday is coming. Some of us have been going through the challenges of Friday. But Sunday is coming. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes, I know, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, hope it was a blessing.